Morning, everybody. Big crowd. You're all very welcome. We're delighted to have Kieran here, and I'll introduce them in a moment. Fortna Murphy is my name. Let's put it this way: I have a background in law enforcement. Um, <coughs> just a few housekeeping issues. Um, mobile phones to silent, please. The institute uh, encourages tweeting, but the mobiles have to be on on, uh, on silent. Um, we're very lucky to have Kieran Martin. Kieran is the current chief executive officer of the National Cyber Security Centre in GCHQ in the UK. And he's in his address to us today, he'll talk about the pioneering work of the National Cyber Security Centre and the role it plays in developing government policy. Mr. Martin will discuss how the, the centre protects both national and business interests from major cyber attacks and helps people understand the risks around cyber security. Our, our event will be as normal, it will last about an hour. The first 30 minutes or so will be Kieran's presentation, which will be on the record. And the second half we will have an opportunity for um, questions and answers, which will be in under Chatham House rules. As you know, you can attribute, well you can refer to the, the, the the comments and that you can't attribute them to any speaker or to any other person who is who's present at that stage. Kieran Martin was appointed chief he's a Northern Ireland guy, an Irishman. Kieran Martin was appointed Chief Executive Officer of the National Cyber Security Centre on the fifteenth of March twenty sixteen, having previously held the role of GCHQ's Director <coughs> General for Cyber Security since February two thousand and fourteen. And as the CEO, he leads the public facing London Centre, the UK's technical authority on cyber security, aiming to make the UK the safest place to live and do business online. Uh, previously, he held uh, further positions as, uh, uh, spent eight years in the Cabinet Office as Constitution Director, Director of Security Intelligence, and prin Principal Private Secretary to Cabinet Secretary. The whole area of cyber security sounds very complex to a lot of lot of us. Um, I hope that Kieran will demystify some of that this morning and give us some ideas about what we can do to, to defend against the threat going forward. So Kieran, you're very welcome. <coughs> We're delighted to have you and the floor is yours. Um, thanks, Vakna. That's very generous of you and very generous for the round of applause given I haven't actually done anything yet. Uh, just leave these here. Dangerous. Uh, they're, they're dangerous, uh, dangerous ob objects. Very nice to be back in Dublin. Hope it's more successful than my last visit because I'm from Tyrone and I was here in September for the All Ireland final. So I'll just get out of the way for any uh, dubs in the um, uh, for any dubs in the room. Thank you. Um, I was just talking to um, uh, downstairs to the former Justice Minister Nora Owen. Um, it was a pleasure to see um, who was asking about, if you like, uh, or who was observing the way in which this subject of cybersecurity is shrouded in mystique and glamour. Indeed, there's a Hollywood dimension to it. We have attackers who seem to hover for working from Russia and North Korea and so forth. They are expert. They, in the words of the President of the United States, they weigh 400 pounds. Uh, they cannot be stopped. Uh, they are undefeatable. And there is nothing we can do. And I was asked to perhaps shed some light on this mystique. And I'm going to start by saying that my objective today, sadly, from your point of view for the next uh, few minutes, is to bore you and get you thinking about everything else other than that, to de-glamorise this subject, because, as I will go on to argue, fear and mystique has been the enemy of sound public policy, good human behaviour, good corporate risk management, good cyber security, and so on. And if you remember nothing else from what we're trying to evangelise around in the National Cybersecurity Centre in London, is that there's a handful of us in any society who will obsess about cybersecurity. It's our job, it's our business. For everybody else, just be good enough and safe enough to get by on a reasonable risk management basis in your daily lives. We're all going to depend on digital services. 
We're going to depend on them for critical public services. We're going to depend on them for corporate prosperity. We're going to depend on, on individual convenience and our happy, the hap general happiness and well-being in our lives. To do that in a way that's safe enough doesn't involve you being a cybersecurity expert. It means about understanding risk, understanding what's most likely to happen uh, to you and taking those sensible steps um, accordingly. So I'm going to start by splitting the threat um, uh, into three. And what's common to all aspects of the threat is that it uh, springs from the way in which the internet evolved. Nobody really designed the internet and it sprang from the sort of liberal, democratic, open society values of the European Enlightenment as transported into western parts of, of the US. And it evolved in a way in which the price of entry into digital services, by and large, for the last 20 years of the mass internet has been to tell a company or a government <coughs> lots of information about yourself for free and get a service for free. And funnily enough, that's not the best way to keep information safe. And we've suffered from that. It's nobody's fault. Let's accept the world is as it is what we'd like it to be. And that means that at national level, we need to worry about three quite different um, but overlapping uh, sen uh, sets of threats. There's the critical services on which we all depend. Now, in terms of people who might attack those, it will often be hostile states. More often than not, it will be hostile states. So in the UK, we've had one significant experience of this, which was last May in English and Scottish hospitals, a North Korean ransomware attack. What was interesting about that, apart from it was extremely challenging to deal with and illustrated the disruption to public services that could happen from cyber uh, attack, what was interesting about that was that it was unintentional. It was an attempt by the North Korean state to raise money by blackmailing people. It was a really badly executed attack, which meant it, it, it spread into all sorts of areas that, we, um, that, that the attackers didn't want it to. Because if you're trying to blackmail people for money, then the English and Scottish National Health Service is a pretty silly place <laughs> to go. More seriously, in terms of deglamorizing the threat but trying to understand it, it remains the case that whilst as um, the new commissioner, um, Drew Harris, was reminding me last night, there has been lots of cyber-enabled harm. It's still the case that if, as strictly defined, no one on the planet, as far as we know, has yet been physically hurt as a result of a cyber attack. It's not to say it can't happen. And in the very recent past, um, it, we um, very strongly believe and have publicly said that the Russian state has set a Ukrainian power station on fire, which by definition could have hurt somebody. Um, thankfully, it did not. But it shows you the extent of what might happen. But let's also be realistic about this. It has not yet uh, happened. So we need, to guard, uh, we, we, we need to guard against that sort of disruption, including disruption that imperils physical safety to critical services. So that's the first sort of set of threats. And you can see where I'm going with this. That is obviously something that national governments will want to worry about. The second set of threat is around the corporate sector. Every year, the digital department in the UK does a survey of businesses around cyber breaches, and it has concluded that 43% of um, respondents, which we believe to be a fairly accurate uh, uh, sample, have, have experienced a significant cyber breach in terms of personal data and so forth. Average costs ranging from a small number of thousands of pounds for small businesses onto much higher figures for, uh, for uh, larger businesses. And that sort, of, um, that sort of corporate health issue is around intellectual property, it's around customer data, uh, and, and, and so on. I will, I will come back to that. And then the third set of um, issues is around the safety of individuals, small organizations, charities, and, 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 and so on. The devices in our pockets uh, and, 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 and all of that. Those demands for... Um, those demands for money that people are seeing and, and so on. And here, I'll give you an example. Um, we know of one uh, small business near to one of our major sites. Um, we've become familiar with the case of a small hairdressing salon of four staff receiving a ransomware notice for £1,600, paying it because they believed they had no choice, but suffering um, four days of disruption where they couldn't get any appointments because the system for appointments booking had gone down, having to notify all their customers under law that their data had gone. And thankfully, the small business remained afloat and has recovered from it, but it was a near-death experience um, for, uh, th for the company. 
when we look at that issue from the national policy and national security point of view, it's of zero strategic significance. But how many of those are of national? What's the aggregate number by which it becomes a national issue? And certainly I would assert, and our strategy and work is based on assuming that whilst at the one end you can worry about power station security, indeed the security of elections, something we might come on to in um, uh, discussions, the, wor the, the worry about protecting things that are fundamental to our way of life, to values, to our ability to go out and do uh, an organised society successfully at a national level. But if you have too many of those ransomware attacks on small businesses, on hair salons, on small shops, on people's individual phones, then at a time where everyone across the West is betting on the digital future, you have a serious threat to public confidence in the digital economy and a first order public policy uh, uh, problem. So when in the UK, um, after the 2015 election, the government decided it was gonna have a proper and serious look at cybersecurity, it fundamentally decided, and this wasn't an easy thing to do, it sounds very simple now, but it fundamentally decided that the national strategy was going to look out for two things, high end national security, but the digital well-being of the citizen and it was going to set up a single organization, the National Cyber Security Center, within the intelligence and security <coughs> community, but with a much more public and outward facing uh, 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 function to, 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 to lead on that. And that's the organization I've got the privilege to lead. What sort of things are we doing? I'm gonna presage that by talking about some of the reasons why we've evolved and stopped doing things that we believe as a government um, like other Western governments, we were doing badly um, in, 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 in the past. One is, Western societies, I think, hampered themselves from doing cybersecurity well by spreading that fear, by not explaining very clearly what the risks are and how they're likely to materialize. Everyone in this room is more likely, certainly in terms of the devices in your pocket, to experience serious transnational organized cyber crime than you are to experience the Russians. And defending yourself against that is, um, uh, requires different uh, approaches to some of the things you might see in terms of you know, uh, combating the most aggressive uh, state actor. The way I illustrate this is that, you know, Good defences start with understanding the threat, and one of our primary customers, if you like, is, um, is UK government departments. So we can give the big threat picture. We can give, you know, here's how here, here's how the digital attack map of the world uh, works. But frankly, if I'm talking to the Secretary of State or the Permanent Secretary, the head civil servant of the Department of Work and Pensions, which is the Social Security Department, they don't really give a monkey's about the Russians, and nor should they because they pay out over 100 billion pounds in social security benefits. So the, the big risk in that department is money and the people who target money are organized criminals. If you're talking about the foreign office, diplomatic communications and all the rest of it, then you worry about hostile states. Those are two completely different defensive approaches, but if you don't explain that rationally, calmly, with some evidence, then you're not gonna arrange your defenses correctly. And it's the same, um, it's the same here whether you're talking about um, law firms, whether you're talking about uh, pharmaceuticals and so forth, understand the sort of, uh, the, the sort of risk that you're uh, running. So to give you another example from the private sector, we did a piece of work at the request of the Law Society about assessing the risk to the legal sector. If, you're, if and when I give presentations to the legal community in London about the contents of that report, the only thing anybody remembers is that when they talk about the Russians, those who deal substantially uh, with clients who have interests in that part of the world have got a very specific thing to worry about, those who don't do not and have a more generic threat. End of story. And you can go away and organize your defenses uh, accordingly. So that's replacing fear mongering with good evidence-based publicly disclosed risk assessment. The second is Advi um, correcting advice, which is so impractical to the point it's actively damaging. So we will all, I'm sure, have had um, access to and been told about two, in our view, spectacularly bad pieces of cybersecurity advice. So number one is to organizations, which is you know, the most important thing you can do uh, is to educate your staff how to spot a dodgy email being sent to your corporate network and make sure that they don't click on that, on that link. That's a really important thing you can do. Now, if you can do that as an organization, that's brilliant. 
but it's next to impossible to do it, and it's certainly not a sensible way to base your entire organizational um, cybersecurity on. My technical director is a world-class cybersecurity expert, constantly sought after across the world for his expertise. He has published a blog, which I recommend to you on the NCSC website, called The Serious Side of Pranking. It's about how he almost fell for a spoof email, a link sent to him um, uh, by, a, by a prankster who had fooled senior figures in the White House and the UK Home Office and almost, um, almost got him, because it was that good. If that's somebody with a PhD in maths and 20 years of experience in top-level uh, cybersecurity, and he almost got done, what hope is there, is there for the rest of us with 300 emails a day? So you should assume th that people are going to click on these links, and instead you should worry about ha what happens when the compromise happens, and that is how uh, defences should be organised. The other spectacularly bad piece of advice I'll mention is password guidance. Last year, in one of our proudest moments, um, the US um, uh, thought leader who had devised most Western password guidance, the basis of most Western password guidance this century, uh, more or less recanted his views and said that, um, uh, and said that um, his thinking had evolved based on some of the work that we'd published through a German academic. Because what we'd done was we had commissioned this German ac academic to research what was the cumulative impact on the average human being of modern day password guidance? So given the number of ser digital services most people had um, and most people used, if you followed the following advice, which we've all heard, use long complex passwords, change them 30, every 30 days and use a different one for each service, which used to be what the advice was. If you actually followed that, it was in psychological and mathematical terms, the equivalent of being asked to memorize a new 600 digit number every month. In other words, it is physically impossible to do. I talked to a former uh, member of the UK cabinet the other day. Um, it may be identifiable, but it was in public, so it's fine. Um, um, this is a person who argued an impossible case in front of the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg for the UK government on prisoner voting in French. So he's, he's not a stupid man. He's an extremely clever man. And he talked about when he was appointed to the cabinet, we gave him a device that he could not use. And he could not follow our security procedures. That is our fault, not his. We, are, we were making technology far too hard for people to use. So now we've changed password guidance and we're saying things like use password managers. And if you have a couple of things that you really care about, then you use that top of the uh, state of the art security because you want higher protections for the things you uh, uh, care about. We weren't building in uh, resilience into our um, uh, in, 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 into our systems. You look at some of the compromises where people just walked off with, with everything. You look at what happened in the United States where the Office of Personal Management, in effect database of all US civil servants, uh, was hacked and the attacker spent hours and hours just copying the entire database before anyone uh, uh, noticed. We've learned from that. It doesn't mean that you know, the, the equivalent databases in the UK could never be hacked, but there are trigger mechanisms to say, look, there's been two hours of anomalous activity, so you cauterize the damage at two hours rather than the 24 hours that that, that, that sort of attack um, uh, 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 happened. And then finally, and most powerfully, there was a sense of unnecessary secrecy about this. There are elements of what we do which are deeply classified. There are accesses to attackers that um, we can never uh, talk about. But frankly, and this is a real cultural challenge for security and intelligence agencies, understanding the threat is not enough. One of the drivers for change in our uh, system was a deep and, in my view, entirely justified frustration among senior political decision takers that they felt brilliantly informed about the threat and at worst powerless to do anything about it because we told them that it was all very secret and you know, gave ourselves a pat on the back that we had such a deep understanding of the threat, but of course from their point of view, a frustration. In the last two years, we have probably declassified more information, more threat information than ever before, and I think we lead the world in declassifying uh, threat information, and we've managed to do that more safely than I would have hoped. Cybersecurity does lend itself to disguising the ultimate source of, uh, of, of a data set. And that means if you look at three weeks ago when the joint UK-US-Dutch action against the Russians following the antics of uh, Russian personnel in The Hague, 
one lesser notice part of that is there's an eight-page technical document on our website saying these is, this is what these GRU intrusions look like at a technical level, and anybody in the world can go on the website, download those eight pages of indicators, run them through their system, look at the URLs, look at the destinations, see if they're connected to any of them, and if so, take some action. And that is gold dust. That is mitigating the actual threat. That is making the job of the Russian attackers um, um, harder. So it's those sorts of practical steps that we're taking. So, where does all this um, where does all this lead to? I think it leads to a more activist approach in pursuit of a of a safer internet in both the realms of national security and the digital security of the citizen. So, at the sort of national security end, we do need high end capabilities. We do need a full suite of tools such as diplomatic calling out of unacceptable. Uh, behavior, such as declassifying the information, as I've just talked about, to give people access to the sort of information they need to get rid of um, uh, 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 threats. And we need to do things like building in resilience into critical systems. On the latter point, we are trying to do a program of work over many years where we, at the point at which legacy systems, which are inherently insecure, are phased out, that we get in there in the new system and make it automatically uh, safer. So if you take, for example, something we're doing right now, which is the Bank of England is um, uh, developing a new uh, system for interbank um, payments clearance, so trillions of pounds a year going through that system. How do we make it resilient to attack? We can't make it immune from attack, but how do you make it that you cannot take out the entirety of this system? Um, that is something we're working on right now. How do you configure the social security system, the new universal credit, in a way that, of course, no 100 billion pound system is going to be safe from any form of fraud and theft, but how do you, uh, how do you make sure that it's impossible to defraud the entire system? And we've, we believe we've built in uh, and published details of, of, of how we've done that. So that's the national security sort of end of the threat, of the first of the triplet that I started off with before I finished. The second one is then business. As well as giving business some of this information, I think there is something about the cultural um, aspect of this. And so in September, we published guidance to corporate boards with five questions on what sort of uh, issues executives and non-executives and boards should uh, worry about. Why did we do that? Well, again, in the past, we got this wrong. We used to advise corporate leaders that the solution to cybersecurity was to run their business well. And for those of you in the room who are corporate leaders, I'm sure you could have worked that out all by yourselves without any need of government help. What we didn't have was, what do we, as the National Authority for Cybersecurity, what do we think actually matters in the technical sense? You would not, if you take a, an analogy with something like pension liabilities or health and safety, you would not just leave that to generic questions about risk management and good governance. You would actually have some people and the whole board being equipped to understand a little bit about how these things work. So the five questions, I won't go through them, but they're designed to say, look, do you have somebody who understands the protection of the team who own the security of the network? Do you understand and how do you manage the risk of your supply chain and your contractors? Do you actually understand how your... Um, approach to countering those phishing emails that I talked about um, uh, work. So as well as giving businesses the sort of information uh, that they uh, need, we give them the, uh, the sort of tools to get a little bit more technical to manage the risk of that effectively. And then finally, I think one of the most exciting things is at the consumer end, at the personal end of it, as well as overturning, frankly, mad previous guidance, we're trying to reduce the number of incidents in, in which we have to rely on individual decisions. It goes back to that point. No one here in this room needs to be world class at cybersecurity, just good enough to manage your own lives. And certainly we don't want people to have to take hundreds of individual security decisions every day, every time they open an email. So we're doing some quite frankly cool stuff on reducing the incidences and the impact of those types of emails. We did a pioneering study with our tax authority, HM Revenue and Customs, which was the most spoofed brand in the United Kingdom. If, if, if you'd been in an audience like this in London three years ago and done a show of hands who has had an email um, offering them a tax refund from a fake HMRC website, virtually every hand would have gone up. That's no longer the case because we've uh, worked with them to adapt a long-standing internet protocol about how you authenticate your identity online. And the way it works is it says, 
don't deliver the email, send it to us instead. In the first full year of the operation of that program, we stopped half a billion spoof emails from people pretending to be HM Revenue and Customs, as well as stopping half a billion attacks and giving us half a billion data points on who was doing the attack. The beauty for me in that is that's half a billion fewer instances where somebody had to take a judgment as to whether or not that email was trustworthy. That's the sort of thing. Another thing, briefly before I finish, what we've done is, even when those emails do get through, if we know the destination is bad and someone clicks on the link, we've made it impossible from a government network um, to reach that destination. We've just blocked it. It's a consensual thing. It hasn't needed any new legal powers, but it now means that even if all else fails and somebody working in a government organisation clicks on that dodgy link, it just says, sorry, you can't go here because we know it to be bad. And again, we capture the data on that. So we're trying to do these things rather than just wallow in fear, rather than just wallow in despair and just throw our hands up in the air. We're trying to do these incremental things to make the internet automatically safer. And why does that matter? Because it matters to the attackers. Even the Russians, even the best of the hostile states, rely on these basic weaknesses. They only, they're only as good as they need to be either. We want to make them work harder. We want the A-teams to need to be deployed. At the minute, it's too easy. And to conclude, I just want to mention a little bit about where all this fits in, in terms of cooperation. So I've had a series of excellent discussions yesterday with Irish government counterparts, I'll be doing that um, later on um, uh, uh, today. I think we're looking at greater enhanced bilateral co cooperation across threat sharing, across critical national infrastructure uh, protection and across that technological <coughs> innovation. For those interested in the impact of Brexit on that, there isn't any, and I say that as a matter of objective fact, because the sorts of things we're doing do not depend on legal powers or agreements that um, are dependent on European Union uh, membership, so the sorts of things we're agreeing now, I can come back next year and have the uh, Dublin NCSC over to London to review progress, um, whatever happens in the, if, in the negotiations on the future uh, relationship. Uh, but to conclude on a more philosophic point, this is the ultimate global issue. And there are competing visions of the internet out there now in the way that there weren't in the past. There's the free internet that we want to make safer. And there's the controlled, less free, totalitarian state, balkanized internet, which is gaining traction um, elsewhere. And I would say whatever else happens in terms of geopolitics, that I would hope that we in Europe, in North America, and across the Western world are on the same side on that, and we should rally behind these improvements to keep the internet free and make it safer. Thank you very much for listening.